Uh, David Dean Botrell, Josh Cohen, how are you today? I am well, Josh. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Thank you. I want to thank you for taking the time for me today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Oh, Absolutely thank my you. pleasure. Thank you, sir. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm really excited to talk to you. I, I know we have about an hour or so together. Um, lots to go through, so I, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just jump right into it. Okay. Um, thanks, David. You know, I, I generally like to start with um, a general out of context sort of question, something just based on kind of a fun fact about whoever I'm interviewing. Okay. Yeah, man. And uh, okay. the question that I chose, um, a few years back with uh, your co-writer, uh, Jesse Jones, you wrote, uh -huh. of course, yes, sir, the off-Broadway play Dearly Departed. Um, yep. And if I don't miss my mark, that was adapted into a film version uh, called Kingdom Come, I believe. Um, yeah. And that had Whoopi Goldberg, Jada Pinkett Smith, Hello Cool J. Uh, yeah. I'd really love to know, David, just to kind of kick us off. What was it like going through the experience of creating a screenplay and then seeing it uh, come to life on the screen with these sorts of actors? Um, it's, uh, it was, uh, it was amazing. And, uh, and like a lot of things in the movie business, kind of hard work, uh, mm -hmm. as, as well. Uh, there was, a that script, um, as you said, it was an off Broadway play originally. And then, uh, it, it got adapted into a screenplay. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, the play is, is based on real people. It's based on my family, a couple of stories from Jesse's family, and it's, it's kind of all woven together, and it's about a, a funeral in a small town. And um, uh, we, we, I adapted it into this screenplay, and, uh, and it sh was shopped around a long time, and nobody bought it. Um, people were very complimentary. They said, wow, this is funny, but, you know, really, who's going to come and see this film? And it's an ensemble film, and people don't really like ensemble films, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And so it, it, it was respected, but they were not interested in it. And then um, an odd thing happened, which was the producer of our film uh, was uh, talking to some studio exec and uh, trying to pitch the film yet again. And the studio exec said, no, 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 I'm not, we're not really interested in that. I can tell you right now, we're never going to buy that film. But do you have anything about an African-American family? And, uh, and to which uh, he said, you know what? I might. <laughs> and then he called me and said, do you think this could be an African-American family? And I said, well, sure, it could be. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, small uh, town in the South. It's a working class family. It could be. And he said, okay, two weeks from today, that's what it is. <laughs> and so that's what happened. But like, I, I will just tell you that not the script really wasn't changed very much, like at, like at all, really. Uh, we changed the title of it because the script had been around for a while. Um, and we, I think we changed the family's last name. And other than that, really nothing was changed. And it went out as an African-American family and it sold instantly, like hmm. immediately. Uh, and um, so what happened then was we were sort of launched on this odyssey of, um, of doing this different version of the film. And, uh, and we were, you know, astounded by the cast that we got. And then, um, uh, the movie business is the movie business, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you and say that uh, it, it, things turned out a little differently than all of us thought they were going to turn out. Hmm. Um, so the movie, the resulting movie, turned out a little differently than all of us <laughs> thought it was going to turn out. Um, but uh, there was a happy ending is that it was popular with audiences, and so it made money. And, um, and an entirely new chapter of my career really sort of opened up at that moment because I, I became a screenwriter then and I, I worked um, primarily actually in African-American entertainment for like the next four or five years because of that film Wow! and worked on a lot of projects, m most of which never got made because um, that's the movie business for you. But I, uh, I was working for studios and working with executives and working with movie stars and um, it was a very interesting chapter in my life, for sure. Uh, I, I, I was amazed at the people I met and the people that I got to work with. Uh, it's, it's tough business, and it's, now it's really become bizarre. This was obviously years ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting tale, and a lot, there was a, very, a lot of unexpected things that happened along the way. But I certainly did love uh, – I'll go back to the cast for a second. Yeah. I love the cast. Uh, I found them all to be really funny – um, lovely people. And um, I even worked with LL um, subsequently on a, on a pilot, actually. He had an idea for a pilot, and I worked with him on that briefly um, a couple of years after that. And um, yeah. Wow. That's awesome, David. No, thank you so much for sharing that. Very interesting indeed. Um, 
I would like to scale uh, back for a minute. Um, obviously, I'm very anxious to talk to you about being a working actor and being in what you've described in the past as the um, the the middle class of acting, which uh, right. I, don't, I don't think there's a more brilliant way of putting it. <laughs> um, sure. I, uh, yep, I, I'm tracking to discuss that in, in the book, which I'm uh, extremely excited to talk about. But I, I'd actually have to scale back for a minute there. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, and I'd instead I'd like to ask you, what made it? What was it that made you want to become an actor? When did you think you could make a living doing it, and it became uh, a passion, obviously, but something that you really felt you could do as a vocation? Ah, uh, um, hmm. well, uh, I I remember I even describe it in the book um, be, being in a play uh, in Austin, Texas, which is a long way from Hollywood and a long way from New York. Um, that was just at a at a community theater, and having this moment, this kind of epiphany about. Um, just about the work itself, about the, the job of being an actor. And uh, I, I just remember this moment of walking out on stage. Um, and it was the state the theater was in um, the arena style, meaning there's audience on all four sides. And I just remember walking out and seeing all of these faces, because usually when you're in a proscenium stage, you don't see the audience that well. There are lights in your face and all that. But in this case, it was hard to miss them. <laughs> and uh, I just remember walking out and I saw all of these faces turn toward me and smile. And I just remember that feeling of oddly, you know, I was maybe about 20, maybe 20 years old when that happened. And I just had this, this, this wonderful feeling that they were happy to see me hmm. and I hadn't even done anything yet. Um, and there was something about the fact that I was willing to stand up in front of them and try to entertain them for a while that had made me this kind of welcome guest on this stage. And it just, it just, I remember just being filled with this energy all of a sudden and, and how much fun I had that night and how great it was and how the, how the show went like terrifically well. It was a comedy. We got lots of laughs. And, hmm. and I remember that night thinking, um, if you don't try to do this for a living, you're an idiot. And probably, I don't know, maybe seven, eight months after that, um, I, I moved to New York, um, and uh, and I arrived here when I was 20 still, and um, and began began that process, and uh, it it was not overnight. <laughs> uh, I, it was probably th almost three years, cl close to three years after I I hit these uh, shores, that um, I got my first actual professional job, uh, an actual union card job, um, but. Uh, that that stretch in between there was um, fueled by a lot of hope and a lot of hard work because I really really wanted it. I really wanted to do it, and um, I, I lucked out. You know, a, a project came along where they were looking for somebody, and that that kind of fit me. And I and hence I got in that door. And then since that time, I've luckily um, managed to stay in the business, <laughs> uh, which is you know slippery sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you made me kind of think of it as you were talking, David. Uh, Conan O'Brien, they asked him about how he, when did he know he wanted to get into show business? And you made yeah. me think of it. Yeah, he, he tells the story of uh, he's an impersonating chaplain. He's like five, six years old, impersonating chaplain. And he has a cane that he's twirling. And he flips, he trips too much onto the cane. And the cane does a whole somersault off stage. And the entire audience laughed. And he said that right. experience is like mainlining adrenaline right into the heart. Pulp Fiction style, yep. <laughs> right? Yep. Um, and that was when we knew we wanted to get into show business. So you just kind of made me think of that as you were talking. Um, uh, no, oh, I'm sorry. Did, were you going to say something? No, it's um, <laughs> you know I, I talk about this in the in the book, uh, which uh, it, but it is it, it's not for everybody. I mean, it truly isn't because it's it's a it's a beast, you know. Uh, but I, I remember, I'm going to go back even further, actually, to when I first I got even interested in acting, period, yeah. which was in high school. And that's a completely fluky thing uh, because I was very shy and very quiet uh, as a kid. And I didn't have any interest in being in the spotlight whatsoever. I wanted just the opposite, actually. I wanted to be invisible. Hmm. And um, and I went to – I don't know why. I really have no idea why I would have done this. But somehow I wound up going to see a play at my high school. And there was a girl in it who was absolutely beautiful. She was so beautiful. And I sort of fell in love with her. I developed this huge crush on her. 
And I did not have any, and she was like a year older than me. And, and I just like, there was nothing about it that seemed remotely possible that I could even get to know her. And I, I waited a year and, and I, I realized, well, okay, the only way I'm going to get to know her is by auditioning for one of these plays. So I was terrified, but I went into audition for this play. And uh, as luck would have it, uh, there were five roles for boys in the play, and there were five boys who were auditioning. So I got in. <laughs> um, and, and then once I got in, I discovered she wasn't in the play. Ah, damn. And then I was stuck in this thing, and I didn't know what to do. Uh, so I just kind of did it. And I, I'm absolutely sure that I was terrible, but uh, it was a comedy. And I do remember that the first night we got up there, I said one of the lines and there was a huge laugh. And I, I'm sure it had nothing to do with my acting. It just, I'm sure the line was funny. But I do remember that very electric feeling of um, people laughing and that um, I, was, I was up there. I was like in the spotlight for that moment, which again was the antithesis of what I had wanted previously. And um, it, was, it, it wasn't me. Like it was me, but it wasn't me because I was doing like some German accent or something. And I was, I, I was in some funny costume and everything about it was uh, not me. Mm. And, but it was different. And my, and the people who from my high school who were in the audience responded differently to me the next day, I was not invisible anymore. And that was a big eye opener as well. And I, and I really sort of found it kind of intriguing to, not be myself um and that that's what got me started interested in acting period and then and then uh like i said i kind of kept doing it but it wasn't until i was maybe 20 that i actually considered doing it professionally um and uh and look look at the mess it's gotten me into today <laughs> <laughs> I, you lived your whole life oh, to well. now, be, now be talking to me oh no what you do wrong more. right <laughs> um no, that's funny. I appreciate that, David. Um, the, the next subject I want to talk about, uh, I have to actually begin by a very brief reminiscence. Um, when I was in high school, my all-time favorite show, and I mean all-time favorite show, was Boston Legal. <laughs> uh. And on strength of the acting in that show, uh, I mean, James Spader obviously is a, a rock star. He's still one of my yeah. all-time favorite actors. Um, yeah. And also uh, the performance of... Uh, Lincoln Meyer, I have to say, um, <laughs> the those two characters um, inspired me to take an acting class in college. Ah, excellent! Uh, yeah, um, I found your performance. Uh, we'll get there in a minute, but I, I found your performance as Lincoln Meyer to be just intoxicating. I just, I something oh. about it just made me want to. I, I don't know quite what that energy is, but I want to, I want to swim in that. If that's not too haughty a term. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, took an acting class. Obviously, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, didn't didn't pan out, but uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, so I wanted to, you know, abuse my power somewhat as interviewer and, and let you know that. Oh well, I I I, I thank I thank you. Uh, I, I thank you for the compliment about it, and um, and I'm glad that it inspired you. <laughs> that's I think that that's a that's a cool thing. Um, it inspired you to try something new, and that's a very important thing in life. <laughs> is to try something new. So I'm really happy about that. So, uh, so thank you, thank you very much. And that was a very um, extraordinary experience uh, to be on that show. That was really um, unexpected, as as I'm sure you know, and yes. also um, quite life changing um, uh, for me uh, as an artist. And uh, and and you, as you spoke of it before. It was uh, for those of you who are um, weren't watching TV a decade ago. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was a very popular show, it, and, and the the time in which I was on it was kind of the zenith of that show in terms of its ratings and all that. It, it was uh, pretty highly rated, and um, I, I I had maybe seen that show once. Um, really, I, I really yeah. I, I mean, I was not a regular watcher of the show. I I remember I'd, I'd seen one episode, and I, maybe not even the whole episode, maybe, but I remember. I'd seen one thing that was incredibly funny, incredibly funny opening scene between William Shatter and Carl Reiner that I thought was just genius. And then, um, but that's, I didn't know a lot about the show when I walked into audition for it. And, um, and I, and I think I tell the story in the book as well, but I had not really done any acting in years uh, at the time that my phone rang. 
um, uh, and I was asked to come and audition for it, and I, I turned it down. I mean, I, I turned the audition down, I should hmm. say. Uh, I, 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 the casting director was very kind, uh, and she, and she uh, sought me out, and uh, and I said, "What? I haven't been acting. In, I've been just working as a writer like for years now, and I don't really have any great desire to return to acting. And, and why on earth are you calling me?" <laughs> and um, she said, "Well, I remembered you from this play." that I saw you in and she told me the name of the play and that had been 20 years previous to this phone call. And I thought, what are you, tw 20 years, you remember that play? And she said, yes. Uh, and she said, and I, in that play, of course, quite a bit younger at that time, I had played um, a young man who uh, had suffered a terrible brain injury and, um, and had a really difficult time like communicating and navigating the world because of his brain injury. And um, she said, I just remember how weird you were in that play. <laughs> and she said, I don't mean that in a bad way, but like just how you were just so genuinely weird. And I know that they're looking for something weird in this. And um, and she gave me this sort of basic breakdown, which was kind of a Truman Capote kind of character. And right. um, and I said, I don't do Truman Capote. Like, I don't, I don't really do that imitation. And um, I, I, Again, this is recounted in the, in the in the book. I believe it is anyway. Where I came up with something else, which was someone out of my own life uh, that when I was a young actor, I used to um, bartend for his parties, and he was a very eccentric, strange, very waspy with a weird accent guy who uh, was ab was a total alcoholic, which Lincoln was mm. not, but but he but he, he was the character. The original guy was. And uh, spoke with great confidence, especially when he was drunk, about subjects that he knew nothing about. And when I was trying to figure out what to do for this audition, I thought about him. And I thought, I, I'm really not an actor anymore. I got nothing to lose here. And so I'm just going to go in and do this guy because when I did the lines, speaking as he spoke and with the level of confidence that he always had, um, I thought it was funny. Like I actually in my living room, I thought this is kind of funny or I think it's funny anyway. And I took it in and um, luckily for me, everybody in the room uh, the day of that audition thought it was extremely funny. <laughs> and um, suddenly uh, it went from one episode uh, to that really remarkable season three of um, Boston Legal. And it was, I, it, I completely never saw it coming. And uh it, and it was astounding because the, the role just kept getting bigger and more sort of multi-dimensional as it went along. And, um, and I found myself acting opposite some very heavy duty people, um, in two person scenes with them. And I, I was amazed that this was happening and yet it did. And it was, uh, my 15 minutes of fame, <laughs> truthfully, uh, because, people really embraced that character as bizarre as he was, you know? And, uh, and it was my first time having an experience where, um, a character was actually written for me, mm. you know, I, I, it was, you know, obviously it's not me, but David Kelly thought that that idea that I had for him was very funny. And so he got very intrigued. So every week I would just open the script and I'd be just astounded at what David, you know, had written. And then we would just jump in and do it. And um, I was kind of figuring it out as I went. Um, but it, uh, you know, and there were a couple of moments when I would say to people, is this like too weird or is this going too far? Like, is this too dark or is this too like whatever? And they would usually say, no, <laughs> just keep going, just keep going. And so I was really kind of trusting them. And it was the trust was well placed because it was just an extraordinary it was an extraordinary experience. I mean, that it was just such an incredible role, and yeah. to have people respond the way that they did to it, and both think he was funny, and they and they also thought he was terrifying, and they also felt sorry for him mm -hmm. sometimes. And it was a, uh, it was again, I, I I can only take some of the credit for that because it was so well written by David Kelly. But um, wow, it was quite a quite a journey for me. I I don't know if I'll ever have a role that good again, honestly. But it was, uh, I'm grateful, to, I'm so grateful to have had it because it really did change everything. It, it changed my entire life and career and put me back in the acting business after an absence um, and put me back in a really nice way. So 
it, it changed things amazingly for me. And thank you for asking me about it, Josh. Oh, no, you're, uh, believe me, my pleasure. Thank you for answering. <laughs> I've been wanting to ask you that question for 10 years. So, <laughs> um, I, uh, no, when you mentioned, you know, heavy hitters, I mean, my God, Julie Bowen, Craig Bierko, I mean, to name just a few. I mean, you had many, many yeah. scenes with, with Bierko. I, I know you had a few scenes with Constance Zimmer as well. I mean, just yep. some incredible, incredible actors and actresses. Um, Not to mention William Shatner and Candace Shatner. Bergen and... Yep, it's incredible. Um, I, I want to uh, tell you something. I want just let me talk about Bill Shatner for one second. By all means, uh, I I I'm of the generation that you know I was addicted to Star Trek uh, when I was a kid, and I and even when it was off the air, I watched the reruns like forever. And when it, when it first came on, I was really small, and by the time I was a teenager, it was on the air like five times a week in reruns, and I watched them all. I loved that show, loved it. And the first day that I worked on Boston Legal. Um, I was in the makeup trailer and uh, I was, you know, talking to the makeup lady or whatever. And then Bill came in, Bill Shatner came in and sat down in the chair next to me and started talking to his makeup lady. And I couldn't talk anymore. Like I was, I just completely froze. I could not say anything because I was so starstruck that he was there. And he was very nice and, you know, all that. And, you know, I didn't say anything the entire time he was having his makeup done. And, uh, and then when he got up, he gave me this little clap on the shoulder and said, welcome aboard and walked out. And I, I just felt like I died and gone to heaven. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> because he, he was, you know, Captain Kirk had said, welcome aboard. Of all the things he could have said, he said, welcome aboard. <laughs> that is awesome. It was, it was a big, like a big moment in my life. I'll tell you that. And then later on, I actually had a little plot line with him and I got to actually work with him, which was also a great joy for me because he's very funny. He's a very funny man. I mean, his his uh, performance as Denny Crane. I mean, in in preparation for this interview, I've been rewatching Boston Legal. Um, well, also because I found out Amazon Prime has it, right? <laughs> oh, great! Um, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I forgot just how much I love that show. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I know you heard me, you know, talk about James Bader a little bit earlier. He's still one of my favorites. I've been watching The Blacklist, yeah. which I know you've you've been on as well. Um, yeah. By my reckoning, I think you only have one scene with, with Spader as Alan Shore in the entire arc, and uh, you don't speak with him. I believe he gives you a, a death glare as you as you walk up to the secretary <laughs> desk. Can you tell him a fan? <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, he was actually the only actor. I mean, we, I think we were in a scene together or a scene and a half or whatever, but uh, it, we didn't really have much... Um, uh, I mean, it, he, he's a. I, I was. He was very complimentary and nice to me. I when I was only been on. The, I'd been on the show maybe two, three times or something, and um, I, I wasn't working that particular day. I was home, and um, the phone rang, and it was the production office. And I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, they're just changing the schedule, or they're going to send me new pages, or whatever it was. And the production office called and said, oh, "We have James Spader on the line for you." Hmm. And I, I was I, again. I was like. Uh, I was immediately terrified. I kept thinking I must have done something wrong. Like I must have done something. <laughs> I must have said something like that was misinterpreted, uh, and somehow like this is bad. And it was and it was James actually calling um, because he had seen the the rough cut of the episode that we had just shot, and he was calling to be complimentary. And it was just uh, that was absolutely lovely. It was a lovely gesture on his part. He certainly didn't have to do that, um, and I was I was really taken by it. And then. Uh, on, on Blacklist, when I was on Blacklist, um, I, ha I mean, it was lovely to work with him again. I mean, and we really got a chance to work together. We, we had a scene, which unfortunately wound up on the cutting room floor. Um, and so what's left of me in the episode in James is not, it's not a great deal. But there was a really funny, lovely scene that we had that um, this episode ran long. And so it, 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 it met with a, a, you know, a sad fate. But it was lovely to work with him again, and I had forgotten how good he is mm. until I sat opposite him um, and did this scene because uh, it just with each take, I, it, he's just such a fine, fine actor, and I, it was all, I, it was so good. I was almost kind of pulled out of my own character in a weird kind of way. To just, I was just like watching him, uh, but he's just really uh, wonderful, just an incredible artist, and I'm I loved. I just I'm really happy that I got a chance to know him a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, David. That's incredible. Wow. Um, I have just a couple questions left on on Boston Legal, uh, and sure. then I and then I really do want to get to the to the book. Um, sure. Let me see. Uh, 
There was a whole episode that I believe was called Lincoln Meyer. <laughs> Um, yep. And I believe, if I don't miss my mark, uh, it was one of the episodes in which, after you as Lincoln Meyer uh, kidnaps Candy, Candace Bergen as Shirley Schmidt, um, you know, talk about a heavy hitter. <laughs> um, what was it? Okay, so you arrive, you arrive on site and you think, okay, uh, on set rather, and you think, okay, I'm going in against a, a literal legend, right? What is that? What is that mindset like? Are you especially nervous when you're shooting one on ones with Candace Bergen, or do you try to calm your nerves? Um, it's uh, I, 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 it, it was daunting. Mm. Uh, I, I was kind of given a heads up um, that I was going to have a plot line with Candace, and I again that was it was just so shocking to me. Uh, I just had a plot line with with I, uh, Bill in the previous episode or two, and now I was moving into this territory. And uh, I, I, I was scared, honestly. <laughs> and I had, I had, you know, yeah. passed her in the hallway a couple of times, you know, and said hello. But I didn't, I never had a conversation with her ever. Um, but, uh, and then the, I was lucky, actually, in that the first day that I shot with her um, was a scene with Craig Bierko. And so the three of us were in it together. And I felt... Um, really lucky that uh for at least i did it's just like have because i knew craig pretty well by that time and so i had a little buffer you know and the and she was just lovely and um in between takes she was asking me questions like you know where did you come up with that accent and like you know she was very she was lovely she was absolutely lovely and so i i felt a little bit better so then in the subsequent um two or three episodes that we did together where it was mostly she and i um i i just i i felt um safe for lack of a better word because she's quite quite good at what she does and um i i probably shouldn't tell you the exact specifics of this story but <laughs> but there was a there was a a problem that we were having on set just it was kind of a little scripted problem that i didn't i didn't quite understand what to do with the material because it was a it was just a weird hairpin turn that i was being asked to to do and uh uh, the director kind of tried to help me with it and was unable to help me actually kind of made it a little worse. And, uh, <laughs> and she just whispered a little piece of advice to me about how to handle that. And it worked beautifully. And when I saw the final ep when I saw the episode, I thought, Oh my God, she was absolutely right. She was completely right. And, uh, and then of course, again, I'm talking to somebody who's been on camera, you know, forever right she's been in front of cameras and, and done this work forever so it was excellent advice and it was it was whispered to me kind of peer to peer do this trust me do this and it was exactly the right thing to do and um i i, I have nothing but like happy uh memories of the time we worked together and i just think she's great i i i, I love how she is sort of also transitioned as an as an artist um and as an actor because, you know, when she came into the world, uh, you know, in, in the movie world, I should say, um, a, people just couldn't believe how beautiful she was, you know. And um, and so they were surprised to find out she could act. And they were surprised to find out that she could take that beauty and that skill and go from being like the, the box office sexy girlfriend to being a comedian in her own right um, to being, you know, a, a mature actor who could still like have a really interesting career and not have to worry about trying to look like, you know, a 20 year old anymore. And I, I, and I still think she's stunning, but it's, I've really been um, amazed at her, her, the grace at which she's done that in her career. That's awesome. No, I, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I have, uh, obviously, as, as you know, we had a little contest uh, regarding your book. Um, we'll, we'll talk about just a moment in just a moment here titled, Working actor, breaking in, making a living, and making a life in the fabulous trenches of show business. Um, yes. Yes, sir. We, we pulled our audience. Um, basically, uh, describe your favorite Lincoln Meyer scene <laughs> and oh, wow. why. And, uh, and, you know, the, basically the one I like the most. <laughs> I'm a bit okay, of a dictator great. that way, right, is the person that wins. <laughs> it, absolutely. It's, it's your show. You can do it. Hey, any way you want. I have very little power in the world, but that's that. <laughs> um, that's the beauty of the internet. We exactly. all have our own power now. <laughs> so we can all have our own show. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, we, we pulled, and um, in the end, it seems like pretty much everyone won because the, the scene that they described just so happened to be my own personal favorite scene of 
of Lincoln Mile. Oh, yeah? Um, so first off, uh, yes, uh, congratulations to Mark. Uh, and, uh, well, Mr. Uh, Botrell has very graciously offered to sign a, a complimentary copy of a book for you. Um, David, will uh, I'll be giving you that address uh, after our, our interview here. Sure. Um, sure. Well, well is, if Mark is watching, congratulations, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, nope. I uh, hope uh, hope he is. <laughs> It'd be awkward if he wasn't. Um, and uh, and yes. So that scene. Um, you. Uh, it was an incredible scene of acting. I thought uh, because you were playing simultaneously creepy, slightly funny, and also sad. And mm -hmm. it's that scene. Uh, I'm sure you remember in the, in your sat down in the hallway outside of court. You just tried to sue um, Jeffrey Coho as Craig Bierko as Jeffrey Coho. Yep. He observes you and um, and you uh, you go with that line at the end. No, no, what you say, what you said to me in court, it was very personal. Um, yep. And uh, I promise I won't make you do the Lincoln Meyer voice, so don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I've heard in previous interviews you uh, would rather not, so I respect that. <laughs> So thanks. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I'm I that that's a yes. That, a lot of people remember that scene. Um, and uh, what's interesting to me uh, about this, which I guess not a lot of people would know, is um, you know at that time uh, there was a long story. That particular season, we were a little uh, we were a little behind for because of technical reasons. And uh, so the shooting schedules were really long and fast, and we were sometimes shooting two episodes at the same time. And um, I had completed that episode and was now shooting the next episode when I got this call again from the production office saying, um, David Kelly wants to shoot an additional scene for the episode we just finished. And uh, so can you, you know, can you shoot this tomorrow morning? And I said, well, I'm, I, I'm called it, you know, whatever, to shoot the other scene. Is that changing? And they said, no, no, we're going to shoot it before then. <clears throat> Can you be here at like 5 o'clock in the morning? <clears throat> and I was like, okay. And they said, okay, we're sending you the scene. And so uh, I got that scene the night before. And I, I remember reading it and thinking, oh, my God. Uh, like, they're, they're, that character had not had any scene like that at all. Mm -hmm. Um prior to that and i thought holy shit you know uh and we're gonna shoot this tomorrow morning at 5 a.m <laughs> and and that's what we did you know uh i i drove down to manhattan beach i got up at like three o'clock in the morning and i drove to manhattan beach and we shot that scene at like five five something in the morning um craig bierko and i and uh and i it was just uh i just was struck by what i it was so sad and um personal and it, it and it changed everything. I mean, it, it, people were people liked that character before, I and mean, I was already getting kind of fan mail and people. But up to that time, he'd mostly just been um, funny and creepy, you know, and uh, maybe a little sinister. I think I might have committed a murder by that time. Uh, <laughs> I might have. You would have killed um, a judge, I think. At that I think point. I probably had killed a judge by yeah. that time. Yeah, and, and <laughs> attempted to kill uh, Gracie. Gracie Jane. But, right. uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, it was it was so different. And um, and lovely, and uh, it again that was another big sort of and again that was and we did it kind of on the fly and then I went straight into shooting the next episode even literally the same day, and didn't really think much about it until the episode aired, and um, and then so many people commented about it or wrote about it and all that because it was uh, it was a, a real change in what they'd seen, and and David you know it, it just kind of deepened everything and made it. Um, it made him more desperate and it was, it was, I was, that was a personally, that's a big favorite. I have some other favorites as well, honestly, uh, that scenes, but I'm glad that people remember that. I really am because that was lovely work and it was love and Craig's work was lovely you know, as well. And it was, it was a pleasure to shoot it for sure. Yeah, very much so, man. No, thank you. Um, oh, by the way, that, that was the scene, especially that made me want to take that acting class I was telling you about. Oh, so, great. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, yes. Yeah, so once again, the book, uh, which I'm as anxious to talk about as, as you are, trust me. Sure, um, sure. Working actor, breaking in, making a living, and making a life in the fabulous trenches of show business. We'll return back to that term that we were talking about earlier, the uh, the middle class of uh, of acting. Yeah. Um, perhaps I'll start off just, I guess, nice and easy. Uh, what prompted you to want to write this book? 
Um, I had been thinking about it for a while, mm. actually. Um, around 2008, I think it was, I was um, asked to teach a seminar. And um, I was very hesitant to do that because I'd, I'd never really done any teaching. And then um, it, it, I had a great time. As, and the people who attended were, were complimentary. And it's, it started me teaching. And so I've been teaching for about 12 years on and off. Um, and a bunch of places, UCLA and um, you, all over the place. But anyway, um, it's been fun. I really loved it, actually. And one of the things I sort of found was when students were graduating, there was not much guidance about how to go forward, like how to actually do this, like outside of a classroom and how to get paid for it and how to, you know, maneuver your way through showbiz or even understand what show business even is, you know. And all, all you see is the product. You don't really see how the sausage is made, you know? And uh, so I, I'd been thinking about it for a while. And um, I, about th uh, three and a half years or so ago, I made a very big change in my life and, and career because I, I, after 20 something years in Los Angeles, I actually moved back to New York where I started many, many years ago. And when I moved back, I thought, you know, it's, it's a new city, it's a new chapter. I should do something new. So I decided to write a proposal for this book and write some sam sample chapters and so forth. And unbelievably, I had beginner's luck. And mm -hmm. uh, the book sold very quickly, and suddenly I was writing it very quickly. And it only took about six months for me to write it because it really just poured out um, of me because I, I you know, I, I've had a good time in my career. I've actually really enjoyed it. I've worked with some great people. Um, I, I've worked both on some amazing projects and some terrible projects in my career. And, and I've, I've worked with actors I thought were, you know, just angels and geniuses. And I've worked with people that I thought were just horrible people, too. And I've, I've, made, I've gone through periods of my career where I made some substantial money and periods where I made almost nothing. And so when I, when I sat down to write about it, I thought, well, you know, who am I to write a book? I'm not famous, you know, like. I'm not, you know, and I, and I thought, well, but very few of us actually are, you know, there's a big acting community and very few of us are famous. Mm -hmm. We just are actors and we work in the projects as they come along and, you know, uh, and we support whoever the star is and all that. And it's, it's, it's kind of a cool, lovely thing. And I, I thought it's just really hard because most people, and sadly, this is still the case. They equate um, successful actor means famous actor, movie star, and like yeah, or TV star. You know, mm -hmm. but like your your name above the title, or you're the opening credits, or whatever, and that makes you successful. And I thought, gee, I know a lot of people are successful, but they're not famous. You don't know their names. You might know their faces, but you don't know their names. And that was the beginning of it. And the original title of the book, which uh, we uh, the publisher and I sort of grappled over and I wound up uh, going with the title that they suggested uh, but my original title was called Overnight Sensation How to Be Moderately Successful in Show Business in 35 Short Years <laughs> which I thought was a great title Yeah, and uh, they were a little worried about that and they got uh, you know it's a new era and they, they were sort of worried about words that could show up in a Google search and um, so instead, we went with "working actor," which is a perfectly lovely uh, title. I don't, I don't mind it a bit. Um, but uh, I, I, I've again had a really wonderful experience with writing the book with people um, reading it. Even people who are not in show business um, have been reading it and, and writing to me about um, their experience reading it and said, you know, there's a lot in here that's just good advice. Period mm -hmm. about whatever career you're in, not necessarily acting. Um, but to how to balance all of that as well, balance career and life, because in as a actor and any kind of artist, really, it's a real juggling act. Um, your hours are a little different every day of the week, and and your job obligations are a little bit different with each job. So it's a it's a whole new world. But but I just I I honestly wanted to be helpful, but I also wanted to be honest uh, when I wrote it, and I wanted it to be fun to read mm. uh, because. If if it doesn't if it isn't fun, honestly, no actor is going to stick with it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? If if you know what I mean, if it's not an enjoyable experience to read a book about a career in show business, they're not going to finish the book. They're, right. they're not going to finish it. And instead, uh, people seem to really 
enjoy reading the book because it's pretty funny. You know, it's got a lot of funny stories in it. It's intended to be funny, and it's also um, frank. You know, I'm, I'm frank about what the job is, and it's not for everybody. Um, but uh, if you do, if you are interested in it, or you think you might be, or you have a friend, a acquaintance, a relative, a child who's interested in acting, <laughs> I, I'd say let him read it. You know, because um, I think it's a pretty uh, on the nose depiction of what it is to just be a work a working actor, somebody who actually does this. Sure. So um, uh, I mean, I, it's been a, I'm proud of it. I'm, it's one of the things I'm really most proud of in the stuff that I've done in my career is the writing of that book. So here we go. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, yeah, I mean, one one part of the book that I was anxious to kind of uh, dig up and, and talk about with you um, is the, the do's and don'ts of the auditioning process. Um, uh, one of my favorite stories that I've heard uh, regarding auditioning is uh, Edward Norton when he went into audition for uh, Primal Fear, right? His, his first, you know, his debut movie role. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the the legend, the legacy. I don't know if this is true or not, uh, but the legend goes that he walked in to auditions in character, stuttering and having that sort of gait, etc. Um, and I'd like to use that to kind of ask you: Would you mind kind of maybe running through what's what would be an example in your mind of an ideal audition versus a I don't audition? <laughs> sure. Um, uh... And I, and when I say this, uh, even though I'm the you know author of a book that doesn't make the, me an expert on this particular subject, but I will tell you that um, for myself, uh, the 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 big change for me, like the thing that I learned how to do, um, that started making me successful in auditions in terms of actually booking work, mm. was I stopped trying to get a job when I walked into an audition. I. Uh, I, I took it as an opportunity to do two things. Uh, one of them is to just act, just an opportunity to be an actor. Um, uh, auditioning is, in my opinion anyway, um, it's just acting under less than ideal circumstances. But it's still acting. And I like acting. So I, I try to frame it in a positive sense in that way, that I have an opportunity to do this thing that I like to do. And um, the other thing was, uh, like I said, I stopped. Um, I stopped trying to. Wor I stopped worrying about like, are they going to like me or not? You mm -hmm. know, and instead thought, okay, David, um, if you had to shoot this role tomorrow, like, what would you actually go on set and do? Like, what would be? What's your take on it? And I, I, I largely thought, okay, I'm going to like show them something um, that. Um, that I do well, you know. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'll, I'm going to harken back to Lincoln Meyer. I, I'm quite sure. I know for a fact that uh, nobody else who auditioned for Lincoln Meyer did what I did, you know, uh, because they didn't know that guy that I had worked for when I was a young guy going to put myself through school bartending. They didn't know him. I knew him, and I knew I could not do Truman Capote. I could have gone in and done Truman Capote which is what it said on the breakdown for the audition, mm -hmm. but it would have sucked. And that would have been the end of that. Um, instead, I, I chose to do something that works for me, like that I'm good at, and that still fit the material. Like I didn't change the material, I didn't rewrite the material in any way. And, um, and I just sort of discovered uh, over and over again, professionally, that I can think of several shows like Mad Men and um, Justified and uh, CSI and so forth, that, or I'm sorry, NCIS, mm -hmm. um, that are jobs that I booked where I, what I did was very, very different than what the description of the character was. Like, uh, because I, I read it and I thought, I, I don't do that. Like, that's not something I do well. So why go in there and stink up the joint? Um, and instead, why don't I go in and do something that I know I can bring to life or that I know that I can pull off? And um, and in all three instances, it got me the job. Um, and so, I'm always very big on telling people, uh, your you know your job's to shine, and and to go in and perform. You know, go in go in and like be seen. Don't don't hide and don't be timid. Go in and let them see you actually do what you would do this time next week if you got the job. And and don't go in there with any sort of I don't know how to say it exactly, but I, I, I don't I, I don't wish to be unhappy when I'm auditioning. <laughs> like I don't want to feel pressured. Yeah. I don't want to feel like uh, 
these people, whoever they are, and they got a job to do, and I understand they've got to cast a movie, they got to audition a lot of people, I, I don't want to put my well-being in their hands, you know? I want to feel like, okay, this is my this is my show, and I'm going to do it. And I and I kind of think that the the best way to look at auditioning is it's just part of the job. And uh, part of my job is I go around and I do these little shows in people's offices. Hmm. And um, and I there's there's no reason to worry about it. It's just part of the job. And I try to do a good show when I go in, and either they will buy that or they won't. But uh, it doesn't mean I'm a bad actor if they don't buy it. It just means they were looking for something different today than what I was selling. But it doesn't mean my product is bad or that I'm bad. So I, I will say that my favorite, the best auditions, in my opinion, are those that you, you bring yourself and your talent to the party and you bring it confidently. Yeah. And that you don't leave feeling like you're some disaster um, because that's, that's, that'll kill you. <laughs> You know, um, the, the worst auditions are the ones where I feel like you, uh, it, for one thing, if you don't serve the material, like if you don't, like the, the scene's about something. Um, and if you don't, you have to execute whatever that, whatever happens, happens. If I'm there to beg for money, I'm there to beg for money. If I'm there to try to seduce somebody, I'm there to seduce somebody. And when you, when you don't, when you miss that boat and you just go in and try to give some kind of performance where you, you're playing every emotion in the rainbow, or you're trying to convince them that you're brilliant or something, and you and you miss what actually is occurring in the scene. That's a pretty bad audition, right there. Hmm. I think that's. I, I wouldn't want to hire that actor if they didn't. If they did literally missed what the scene was about, that'd be bad. You know. Absolutely. Well, um, not to digress too much, but again, I just kind of thinking about it. Uh, when Jamie Foxx was interviewed about his time working with Quentin Tarantino on Django Unchained, um, he was quoted as saying. Um, he originally tried to attack the character as being the badass, the action hero, the right. the macho tough guy, right? And I guess right. I guess Tarantino uh, takes him aside and basically yells at him and says, "Man, no, you're a slave. You're supposed to play a slave. You're not cool. You can't read. Get into the character of a slave, and then you become the badass halfway through the mark." Just kind of picking right. you up on the on the what you're meant to bring to bear to a audition or right. part. Um, right. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm curious. Was there a what was your what was there a particular part of the book that you especially enjoyed writing? Uh, wow, that's a good question. Hmm. Um, I I I can say that through throughout the book, um, I mean, I, I sort of knew there were a bunch of topics that I had to cover, and throughout the book, I almost in every chapter it opens with a story, and uh, that was probably my favorite part of the book because I'm, I also do storytelling shows uh, where I just stand up and I tell true events out of my life. Um, and um, so I, I like that. I like that, that part of it. And I just, it was amazing what I remember. There were things I hadn't thought about in years. And I, I suddenly thought, oh, that's a good story. That's a good way to sort of start talking about this subject. And what I really started to like about that, which is I think actually what sold the book to the publisher was um, as opposed to the book being sort of dry um, and sort mm. of just like a bunch of like, you know, facts and figures and lessons of some sort, um, every book is illustrated by what I hope is kind of a human experience, you know, um, so that you know what you're getting into <laughs> because it's not just a job. It, it's it's a whole way of life that you're taking on. It's going to shape how your personal life goes as well. Uh, it's going to shape your finances. It's going to shape everything. It's going to shape your worldview, and a lot of it's going to be in these odd, strange things that you wind up in sometimes, mm. odd situations, I should say, or, or, or odd predicaments or odd decisions that you got to make. And um, so telling the stories was my favorite part because it gave me a chance to personalize it a little bit um, and, uh, and and open myself up a little bit too, just to be frank, to be honest. And I, and I tell stories about you know mistakes I made as well, things that I didn't do well or didn't handle well. And it's, it's a little like, here's a little tale. Keep this in mind <laughs> as you <laughs> as you travel down the road. Don't make this mistake. That's fantastic. Um, no, very cool, David. Uh, how can people, where can people uh, get the book? Um, it is available, as they say, wherever fine books are sold. <laughs> uh, it, it is published by Random House. Uh, it is available certainly on Amazon. And uh, I, I think bookstores are open now. I don't. I don't know if they're essential enough to be open or not, but if bookstores are open, it's probably in your local bookstore. It's probably in your Barnes and Noble or whatever your local bookstore is. 
Um, but it's pretty easy to get online, that's for sure. And or, and also, it's um, uh, Random House is the publisher, so you can you can. It's pretty easy to lay hands on. Let's put it that way. <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with that. Um, this might be end up being kind of a dumb question because obviously we're all in the midst of this epidemic pandemic. Uh, are you working on anything currently, David? Um, I am. Um, I am writing right now. Um, it's a, uh, you know, this, uh, what's happened to the whole world, all of us, every one of us, um, is it's, it, it's without precedent. You know, I mean, I, I just don't, I, I don't know in our, in our collective history, when it, I guess I wasn't around in 1918, but, uh, <laughs> but this just feels gigantic because of the way that we, you know, travel in airplanes and go all around the world, like constantly every day, it was probably inevitable that this would become huge. But it really has stopped uh, us all. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just figuring it out now. And it's been pretty much impossible for my industry, which is either live performance or performance in, on a set somewhere, to go forward. And they're just now inching out of that. Okay. Um, and I, uh, I have this... Um, show that i've been doing lately here in new york I, I, I did it years ago and i just re revamped it rewrote it and i'm doing it here in new york and i did it in los angeles i just done a, a week of shows in los angeles call and the show is called david dean botrell makes love a one-man show <laughs> and it's all true stories thank you it's all true story the first laugh even comes with the title yeah but they're all true stories true love stories out of my life and it's about 75 minutes long and i just stand out there and tell these stories and it's, I, I love doing it. Like, I love it. It's very personal, but I loved it. And I just done a bunch of shows in LA. Um, and uh, part of that part of that trip was to get new writing representation. So I, I did achieve that, which is great. And so now I've kind of been spending all this downtime uh, back at the laptop again, um, writing some ideas for television series. Um, so I'm about to sort of throw a couple of things out there and see if anybody takes the bait. Um, and I've gotten, honestly, really, I, one thing the show really made me realize is that at least at this stage of my career, mm -hmm. um, I actually really love saying my own words, words that I wrote, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, and the, and the projects that I'm writing and about to pitch, I, I am attached <laughs> as one of the characters right. in it. So, <laughs> um, so we'll see what happens That's awesome. uh, until such time as we're, you know actively back out there again i just had a self-taped audition the other day which is i suspect going to be the wave of the future now yeah. um uh, but uh, it's been pretty slow but i've been doing that and i've also been teaching online which has been a whole new experience as well does it take what would ordinarily happen in a classroom and put it on zoom um <laughs> it's been a it's been a big learning curve but uh i salute my students they've been incredible they have really adapted to it, so it's been relatively painless, actually. Um, and I'm I'm doing that a little, a little bit of that as well. I've got a, a class I'm teaching for the American Academy that I think wraps up on um, September 11th or something like that. But um, yeah, a little bit of everything and and trying to stay healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, I have just a few questions left, sir. I'm actually really really excited about this part david um you'll uh you'll undoubtedly be familiar with uh inside the actor's studio right sure. um and i'm sure you know at the very end james lipton always goes through that Prowse questionnaire right and i thought yeah what better way to wrap it up than oh. to run that one through that how's that sound sure <laughs> uh sure i'm trying to I'm, I'm thinking back on those interviews but uh yeah a couple of things come to sure let's do it all right so um <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, David Dean Botrell, what is your favorite word? Imagine. What is your least favorite word? Don't. What turns you on? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you heard that or not, but I just got a text. I did. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I am, I am turned on by creativity. Mm -hmm. And 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 I don't just I'm not talking about just my own, but um, it, when I see it in other people and other either in a lot in art, other forms of art, or just in life in general, I'm so impressed that we as a species know that that's a part of that's one of the best parts of life. 
is to creative to create think creatively about something. Absolutely. I think it's just great. So any creativity. Absolutely. What turns you off? Um, I think that uh, I think that cynicism turns me off. Um, it's um, I understand why. You know, it's a rough world we're living in right now. It's a, it's a very rough chapter, and I understand how people get exhausted. But um, I think it's uh, it's a it's a and I think it's an easy out to be cynical. And I I hope we don't. I hope we can keep steering out of those waters. Absolutely. My personal favorite. What's your favorite curse word? Well, that's a tough one because <laughs> I have so many. Um, uh, I I I might. I don't really know if I can really say my favorite one, uh, but I'm going to say my next to favorite one, which would be motherfucker. There you go. And I think what I the reason I enjoy that is it has numerous syllables in yep. it, and it's not just a four letter word. It it's sort of sustains. It sort of floats in the air for a moment, and it's a little. It's got a lot of nice consonants in there as well. I really I enjoy saying that one. I like that. Uh, apropos, given the uh, the Scott Little uh, <laughs> Boston Legal arc, right? <laughs> right. Um, that's funny. Uh, what sound of noise do you love? Rain. Mm. What sound of noise do you hate? Uh, car alarms. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good answer. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, I think I would have liked um, uh, being a music teacher, actually. Um, hmm. There's something about that that um, – not that everybody has to become you know, a professional musician or anything, but it's one of those things that um, when, you, when, you teach, when you teach something like that, uh, whether or not they continue to play an instrument or whatever, they always appreciate – when they see instruments being played or they hear that music, they, they really, they realize that somebody is making that music and somebody did it and that it's a, that it's a thing. And it's, um, and it's just, music is just kind of a powerful thing. And I think if you introduce people to it as a teacher um, and teach them how, how they could do it, if they wanted to do it, I think that's kind of beautiful. It stays with them. I think in life, you can carry that on forever. I think that would have been a fun thing to do actually. Excellent. Excellent. Um, what profession would you absolutely not like to do? <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I don't think I would ever have made a very good therapist. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I, I, I appreciate that people have problems, uh, but I, <laughs> I think that I would not have had the patience to pull that off. Uh, I think I would have been sort of like, oh, come on, just do it. <laughs> Toughen up, Sally. Break up, right. break up with them. Come on. <laughs> you know you want to do that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I might have been a little too impatient and influential <laughs> in that process. <laughs> I'd be too sarcastic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't last either. <laughs> um, uh, last question on the, on the Proust questionnaire. Um, if heaven exists, what would you like to have God say to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? Hmm. That's a really good one. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to go with, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other possible answer is it was very close. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. They, my, um, my, uh, my father was a, a minister. And so I was raised in a very religious household where, yeah. where we, we heard a lot of Sundays about heaven and hell and all that. So uh, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a big believer in either one of those things, but I, it's certainly part of my consciousness because of um, all those many, many, many church services I was in. That's funny. Um, yeah. Um, Robert Downey Jr. When he was, uh, you know, on inside the actor studio, he gave my favorite answer. Uh, you know, what do you want God to, what would you have God say to you? And his answer was, boy, did I have a ball with you. <laughs> <laughs> nice that's very nice um, that's uh very appropriate yeah absolutely um all right my friend i just have uh two questions left and then i'll uh you're no longer my prisoner how's that sound oh uh, this has been a total pleasure there's there's no rush oh no rush at all thank you david i appreciate that um, you could have bonus questions how about that bonus questions there you go i like that um I'm curious, you've been interviewed, you know, over the years, obviously, by people I'm sure more talented and better looking than myself. Uh, 
I'm curious, has there ever been a question that hasn't been asked of you that you wish someone would ask? Wow. Um, that's, well, that's really interesting. Uh, uh, I, I, I will tell you a question that is, uh, huh. Yeah. This, I, I don't know why I'm even saying this, uh, but, um, what, one of the things that's, uh, that's been a part of my life is, uh, as, as I, I, I've been, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm hesitant to call myself an activist, but I've stayed um, active in the things that I believe in and um, believe are important. And um, uh, like everybody always, despite the fact that I'm very openly out and gay, uh, very few interviewers ever, ever ask me anything about that aspect of life, you know? And uh, I don't, it, I mean, it's not the end of the world or anything. I mean, it's not like it's required. And but it's I'm all. It's almost like people are like polite, like they they're like a little afraid that that might offend me in some way to bring that up. Sure. And it doesn't. It doesn't really at all offend me. And uh, it's 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 part of the. It's a big part of the package, and it's a big part of like everything I've ever done is is sort of influenced by that. Honestly, you know. I mean. Uh, I, I'm very grateful to be who I am, mm -hmm. and uh, and without that, without the gay part of me, I, I don't think I would have become as brave as I've become. I, I don't think I would have become as compassionate as I try to be, mm -hmm. and or as um, concerned with justice. Or I don't think I would have had the sense of humor that I've got. And um, and I I just I I, I I've. I've had no choice but to be like in a minority. It, uh, it just was handed to me, and it's a it's a it's a fascinating minority, and uh, I, I'm always in, I'm really proud of it. Like as as and my, I'm proud of my club as a group. I think I'm pretty impressed with what we have done and continue to do. And um, so, but it's but people don't really ask about that very very often, very very rarely. So. That's kind of funny. If you've noticed me kind of smiling once or twice when you were answering, um, when I was prepping for this interview, David, I was you know coming up with my my random question, right, to to kick us sure. off, and uh, sure. it was between the um, the dearly departed, or it was between asking you about a certain uh, HuffPo piece that you wrote some years back. <laughs> uh, I, 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 was it the one about gay marriage? Uh, that was the one. Was uh, it? Oh, was it? Was it the one about uh, actors, getting uh, gay actors playing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Gay, the one, that's I, the I, one. Um, there was a time when I was cracking out a lot of pieces. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, the one about um, uh, this, uh, some, uh, just to catch everybody else up, uh, yeah, uh, someone had gone, I, I forget who he was writing for now, but anyway, uh, wrote and he, and he himself was uh, gay and was saying that he, sorry, he just didn't find uh, Newsweek.com, I believe it was where the piece was published. Sorry, I didn't mean was to it? Oh, there. I think, oh, right, Newsweek, yeah, yeah. Um, but he had, he had written, he was a gay journalist and he, he was writing about, um, how he never found gay actors convincing when they were playing heterosexual characters. And I just, I just found, I was just so offended by it. And I thought it was so, uh, poorly researched, first of all, on his part, just the, just the sheer number of people who had had tremendous, you know, acclaimed, Neil Patrick very Harris. public careers. You <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah. And secondly, who gives a fuck? And and third, um, it it felt like an attempt to create some weird um, screening device or some weird way of of uh, creating some kind of a prism through which we would all be seen. And it's um, again, I, I just kind of like it, it just made me so mad that I wrote that piece. <laughs> <laughs> And and God bless you for being you know um, <laughs> intrepid enough that you went and found that piece. I, I appreciate it because yeah. uh, I I was pleased to have written it and I was pleased with the response that it got and you know I, I got a little I got a little attention for my side of the of the <laughs> argument as well, which was shut the fuck up is really my side of the argument. It's like <laughs> shut up. Well, hey, you know you know you're doing something right if you're pissing people off, right? That's, that's true. That's I, I've lived my life you're by nobody that. Nobody till you have a few enemies. Exactly. Uh, and I'm gonna. I actually have the the quote, the opening couple sentences, just to catch everyone else up. Um, sure. A couple of days ago, a friend sent me a link to a piece published on Newsweek.com that really pissed me off. Writ 
Written by an openly gay entertainment writer, it basically claim, uh, claimed that casting openly gay actors in heterosexual roles simply never works. And end quote. And before I even moved on to the rest of the piece, David, I started, I don't mean this in the wrong way, but I started laughing. And the reason was, my, my, my first thought was probably, I imagined one of the first thoughts that came into your mind, I would guess, Neil Patrick Harris on How I Met Your yeah. Mother. I mean, you must yeah. be joking. <laughs> the most, uh, what shall we say, right. hetero dude on television is Neil Patrick Harris. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely, right. absolutely. And, and, that, and it's a long list. It's a really long list. And, and it just, I don't know, it just was so, it was like, it's funny. Uh, it's a, it, you know, it, all of casting, the, the business of when you're an actor being cast, you know, there's typecasting they talk about and all of that. Obviously, you've heard that many times. And uh, and then you also transition a bunch of times in your career. Like when I started out, I was playing teenagers. And then you 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 age out of that. You become something else. And you look one way, you look another way. And, and you're, I think the next stop on this train is like judge. I think that's the next place I'm headed is like judge. But <laughs> right now, but it's like there there's all kinds of things that happen along the way. And I just kind of think about the number, like long ago, long you know, long ago before this was ever really an issue with me, it, the kind of roles I was playing, I'm, never, I'm blessed in this way, it never mattered. Like it, it never, like the, the guys that I was playing, nobody gave a damn that they had a girlfriend or a wife. It didn't, no, it never crossed their mind. It was uh, they were just some weird character actor, you know, doing some role, and it, and I was blessed in that way. Like I never was like some leading man who had like a big. Thing that that he had to remain, you know, viable as a as a heterosexual sex symbol kind of thing. I never had that pressure on me, uh, but but many have, and uh, and I'm happy. I'm so happy that we're we're kind of finally past that. There's uh, every once in a while something will come up where you think, oh Christ, here we go again. Right. But uh, but largely we're past it. And um, I, there was a time when you know. You know, certain casting directors are the ones that kind of bring you in on jobs, and and there were certain people who um, would only bring me in if it was like a crazy person, and then there were some people who would only bring me in if it was a highly emotional kind of role where they need somebody to really like deliver that, and then um, some were only kind of comedic roles, some were only psychopath roles, and then there were a couple that would only call me in if the word gay was in the character description, huh. like, and uh, and interestingly enough. Uh, those casting directors were also gay, and uh, and any time that my uh, agent would try to get me seen by those particular people um, uh, for something that was didn't have that word in the character description, they were like, "Well, he's not really quite right for that." And I I thought, interesting. Okay, all right. It's a big world. Uh, if I can't get past you, but it, it was a weird, especially from somebody else being gay to say. Oh, I just don't quite think you're believable in anything but that. It's a, it's a, it's, it's but that happens to everybody. Well, you know what? It happens to everybody mm -hmm. in some way. Uh, like there's some department in which you're going to get, you know, shut out. And, and, and you just got to keep moving. And the beauty of working is you meet people um, and then you get, you get around those things. You, you inch around them and you find your way to interesting work. It can, yeah. it can be done, as I say in the book can be done and i'm i'm i, I mean I've, I've been really blessed i mean the, the shows that i've been on i, I have been really really blessed you um, um all of them yeah no you most certainly have um i uh since you've been kind enough to extend our time a little bit maybe maybe we can press on for just a few more minutes if that's okay of course oh, of course thanks david um, so yes sir uh listing your filmography is a daunting task i have to admit um, so I'm going to, I pulled this from your Wikipedia profile and, uh, yeah. So, excuse me, might be a little bit late for me to go through this, but, <laughs> um, his, uh, television work includes guest starring roles on, and the band played on head of the class, Jag, Caroline in the city, mad about you, Dharma and Greg days of our lives, ugly Betty, criminal minds, I Carly castle bones, Harry's law, NCIS justified madmen. Longmire, Modern Family, Law and Order SVU, Rectify, and The Blacklist. Um, that whole um, whole listing is basically every show that me and my mom both love. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I mean that uh, in the best you know, possible I, way, of course. <laughs> thank you, thank yeah. you. Uh, you know, I I uh, I told you I, I teach, and I, I obviously I'm teaching very you know young people. It's a it's a conservatory program, and I have to say, uh, and I I don't really talk about my past glories. I, like I, I don't talk about myself really at all. I just talk about acting. Right. But every once in a while, somebody will get on IMDb or or dig around and find something out. And uh, the thing that they go berserk about is that I was on iCarly. <laughs> Like they're like, like they could give a shit about Mad Men or whatever. It's like you want iCarly, <laughs> and it's like, and they all know the episode. They all remember. Like you were Bob, you were Bob the insurance guy. Oh my god, <laughs> I, it's like a million times bigger than any anything else I've done. And it's like, oh, you were <laughs> Carly, Ari Carly. So it and I when I did it, I didn't even know what iCarly was. Like I had no idea. It was like some kids show. I knew that, but I didn't had no idea that it you know held the uh, you know esteemed position that it does in a lot of people's lives <laughs> that's hilarious um yeah well uh god I, I could ask you about any one of these and just be enthralled um if i'm, <laughs> if I'm being honest well i tell you what i, I actually in, in prep for this interview justified is one of my mom's all-time favorite oh. shows she's she's seen it's it a great show oh absolutely she's seen it three times through uh all the way um yeah so just out of service to my my dear mom um what was it like shooting that episode as the uh store clerk who's asked about uh camera footage right um uh it yeah it, it was uh great uh it was a great experience i i i really loved it and i i loved that show as well I, and your mom has great taste i i love that show when it was on um i was kind of obsessed with getting on it because i'm from kentucky originally yep. and of course that show is set in kentucky and at that time that was the first TV show I've ever heard of that had been set in Kentucky. And uh, needless to say, it was a kind of a glamorized version of Kentucky. And we didn't shoot it in Kentucky, but it, it still it meant a lot to me that I wanted to be on that show. And when I got that audition, when I originally got the material and I read it, it was one of those moments where I thought, fuck, pardon <laughs> me, I swore on your show. By all means. Uh, but I... Fuck okay, yeah. thanks. Oh, that's right. We did the swear words. Who cares? I said motherfucker. It's behind me now. Um, but I, I, I just thought I'm never going to get this part. You know, I know, I know who they're looking for. They're looking for some like you know real sleaze bag. That's what they want. And I, I thought I know those. I like I could even tell them the actor they should call. Like I even thought you know I should just tell them just call this guy. Um, he's who you want. And then I thought ah, shit. Well, I'm you know I'm going to go in and I'm going to try something different. So I did something very, very different than what was intended. And um, and in, in terms of playing somebody who was not a big sleaze ball, but had a secret obsession, you know, had a secret sort of hobby, um, photographing women uh, with no clothing on and, uh, and whatever else could happen after that. But that was just kind of, it was a dirty, dark, shameful kind of secret as opposed to being out front about it and being lascivious about it. And um, and then I had to do the the scene afterwards where I'm all beaten to shit, and yeah. um, and when I got the job, um, uh, Graham Yost, the producer of it, and, and also the director, uh, Bill Johnson, of that episode, uh, said, you know, uh, you know, you know why we cast you, and I said, no, and uh, and they said because you broke our fucking hearts. <laughs> <laughs> we felt so bad for you this role was kind of intended to be this kind of asshole. Um, and we just felt so terrible, terrible for you because of what happens to you in this episode, you know, because you made a little mistake that, you know, gets you in a bad place, mm. but it was lovely. It was a lovely experience. Um, you know, and, and working with Timothy Oliphant was wonderful as well. Um, and working with everybody, Timothy, Timothy and I had the same acting teacher, uh, in New York, which was really lovely. And, huh. and as did Kathy Bates and I had the same acting teacher, which I discovered, when I was working with her, we kind of figured out that we had the same teacher. So that's always a nice thing, you know, it's yeah. a nice connection to that's, those days when it's all the beginning of everything. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's awesome. Um, gosh, let me see. Uh, yeah, it's it's got to be Modern Family. It simply has to be. Okay. <laughs> um, reunites, you uh, know, in, in a way, reunites you and Julie Bowen. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, and uh, I'd love to know what was the what was the process 
like for getting on Modern Family? You auditioned for it, I presume? What was that process I like? I did. Yes, I, I did audition for it. Um, I actually was already here in New York um, when that call came in. I, I had auditioned. Uh, 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 the casting director of that is, is, uh, has been very nice to me over the years. And um, I'm, uh, and he... Um, and I, I had actually auditioned for the original pilot to be one of the gay guys, but I, but I didn't, I wasn't really quite what they were looking for, which I get. And, um, uh, but anyway, I was kind of hoping maybe sooner or later that might come back around. And then it did with this particular weird, weird character. And, um, and I wound up, I actually put myself on tape from New York and, um, and booked it and then had to fly to Los Angeles to shoot it. But it was, again, it was really lovely and oh my God, you know, uh, you know, the two actors we were working with, they're gems, you know, both of them are. They're so, they're just lovely, generous, welcoming people. And that set was an easy place to be. And uh, unlike a lot of uh, Modern Family episodes, um, usually when there's a guest star, it's like you have two lines because they have so many regular characters. They right, right. have a lot of time to deal with something else. But this was a little bit more than that, which was great. And I didn't have any scenes with Julie, um, but I did run into her in the makeup trailer, and it was great to catch up with her because she's lovely. She's a lovely person. And um, way back in our Boston legal days, um, I, I hope she wouldn't be mad if I told the story. Well, I guess we'll find out. But uh, <laughs> but when, when I was shooting a scene with her way, way back in the beginning, um, we, we were on this crazy schedule, and we were shooting at 1 o'clock in the morning. And... Um, and we we had to sort of stand behind this wall and then come out and then enter her office was how, what the shot we were trying to do. And when we went behind the wall, she bent over and started to kind of gag like she was going to throw up. And I was like, uh, oh, my God. And then she was like – and she pulled it together. They called action. She pulled it together. We went out and did it. Wow. And then I didn't know her really. I mean like – and then we went back and we did it again. And she was like – again, like she was going to throw up. And I said – do I, should I get somebody? Like, are you okay? Do I need to talk to somebody? And she was like, and like, we went out, we did it again. And then before we, and then we went back again, she was looking pretty queasy. And she wrote on her legal pad, I'm pregnant. And said, and I was like, I'm not telling nobody. <laughs> like, it, I'd only been on the show a couple of times. And I was like, your secret is safe with me, lady. And um, but I will always remember that because it was wow. every single time I thought she was going to like lose it, and she was such a pro that we she would go out there and we would do that scene over and over again, and she <laughs> she got through it without barfing. So she's the consummate professional forever. And then a couple of weeks after that, she uh, she talked about it, and I think she had her twins. You know, obviously the following year. Wow! But she's great. I love her. She's super funny. I've been a fan of her since Happy Gilmore. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I tell you what, my friend. Um, my uh, producer is starting to give me the uh, the red light here. Uh, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, uh, perhaps I can have you back at some point if you'd like. Uh, That'd be lovely. That'd be great. Oh, this wonderful. was very fun. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. Oh, thanks, David. I, I, that, that means a lot. I appreciate that. Um, let me see. Uh, David Dean Botrell, how can people find out about you, sir? Um, they, they can go to one of the websites. The best one is uh, workingactorthebook.com. Uh, and it's 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 obviously about the book, but it's every anything you want to know about me is on there. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, and it, it just talks about there's connect. You can read a bio, and there's some there's some film clips you can see, and there's a bunch of photographs, like still photographs from a lot of the shows that I've been on, and it's got a little mini story that accompanies the the photographs. It's it's a fun website. Why not? Why the heck not? Why I not? Love it. I love it. Um. Yes, sir. David Dean Botrell, this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking oh, time thank and you. everything for me. Thank you. Thanks a lot for asking me on. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. Awesome. And we will do it again sometime soon. Perhaps when my pilot gets picked up and I'm on TV again, we'll do this all over again. I would love that, David. Thank you so much for the time. Why not? <laughs> Why the heck not? I love it. Um, I will let you go and thank you again so much for everything. I'll watch a, a Lincoln Meyer episode tonight in your honor. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye, David. Thanks, everyone.